Great. Uh, Jeanette Maester back from WCN, which is a campus recruiting technology company, not a news organization. I'm thrilled to introduce Yana Kogan from NASDAQ, and she's going to be talking about behavioral-based interviewing and other techniques. So with that, I will hand it over. Actually, you have a mic, so I will pass it over to the panelists, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Well, uh, I'm Yana Kogan. I'm currently with NASDAQ OMX. And uh, I'm happy to facilitate this today. I was told I don't have to do any work. You guys uh, <laughs> have to do work. That's why we have our wonderful panel, and we're doing it. There you go. Not starting you. over, am I? <laughs> um, I'm glad we're completely sold out today anyway. <laughs> so uh, with that, uh, here's the panel. And I'm going to semi-introduce uh, the first member of the panel. Uh, Travis is going to join NASDAQ OMX in about three weeks. And I asked him to kindly participate with us here. So. Uh, him and I are sort of in the same boat. Okay. So I'm Travis Gidry. I was uh, previously at an investment bank on the street and uh, decided to go over to work with Yana at NASDAQ, and I'm excited about that. So I can speak more from a, a campus recruiting perspective. Hi there, I'm Kelly Goolsby. I'm with KPMG, and I'm, I'm a manager um, here in the New York office uh, for campus recruiting. Uh, ben Gotkin, Principal Consultant with Recruiting Toolbox, uh, have uh, done interview training, behavioral interview training, uh, structured interview, competency-based interview training for over a dozen years, uh, including at my current firm uh, where we do interview training. And actually, this past summer, I uh, did interview training, uh, built out a program for a Canadian uh, financial institution, so uh, specifically for college recruiting, for their college recruiting efforts. So this is very timely for me. So uh, my name is Chaim Shapiro, uh, Assistant Director of Career Services at Toro College. And uh, one of the significant things, one of the significant things that we do in career services, and in, in addition to working with resumes and helping students find jobs, is helping them with their interview skills. So I want to provide a little bit of the career services perspective on how we help students prepare for the kinds of questions that they'll be discussing here today. Appreciate it. Thank you. So we have, we have a pretty uh, uh, diverse panel here, and uh, everybody is going to be extremely valuable. Um, the topic is, as you know, behavioral interviewing and other interview techniques. <clears throat> and so I just wanted to uh, throw it out there. Everywhere I have been and uh, have been involved in university relations and college recruitment, um, I've recommended that behavioral interviewing is part of um, or one of the major elements um, um, in our interviewing on campus. Um, what I have done in the past life is spit out an interview guide for each uh, member of the team that is going on campus, and uh, at least two-thirds of the questions were behavioral-based questions. Uh, that has worked for me, um, but I'm opening it up, and uh, please share what your experiences have been. Um, I know that a lot of um, hiring managers tend to be too hung uh, on to the uh, technical excellence and technical skills. If they're recruiting for accountants, they're going to uh, ask a bunch of accounting questions. And their um, objection sometimes, what I've found, to behavioral interviewing would be, well, they don't have much of uh, experiences to share with you, to walk you through. Um, and uh, I, uh, what I say to that is, of course they do. They don't, do not have work experience for the most part, uh, but they have experience with projects and even with their you know, life experiences. Um, you could still definitely assess for some of those competencies um, that, that, that you're looking for. Right, so that is my take and uh, now I'm done. And yeah, so you know, in my experience, Yana, it, behavioral based questions can really help separate you know, the wheat from the shaft, so to speak. Um, you know, career services do their part in really helping students speak to their resume and speak to their technical skills. And, you know, students re rehearse that and they practice it and they're ready and they know, they know their stuff. But where you could really tell someone's character and someone's work ethic is when you start getting into those behavioral-based questions. It, it shows their personality, it shows their individuality, uh, and it gives them an opportunity to, to show you who they are. Uh, you know, as campus recruiters, we get you know, thousands of, you know, if you have a, a decent sized program, it doesn't even have to be a very large program, 
you can get thousands and thousands of resumes from referrals alone, you know, people that might just apply to the website. And, you know, when you have an opportunity that you're going to decide to meet with someone in person, uh, you know, you have so much to pick from that you want to have some sort of tool in your pocket that can help separate those candidates, you know, and, and get away from just the technical part. That part they need to prove, obviously, but you want to know how they're going to fit into your culture, how they're, how they're going to fit into the program, and how they're going to manage their career, and that can really help you to do that. Um, I think it's also a good indication of um, how the candidate uh, would act in front of a client, how you can kind of get a, a you know, it's a 30-minute interview, 45-minute interview, so you, you have limited time, so I think using the behavioral style um, interview really gives you just a, a good look at, you know, the, the logic and, you know, their thought process and also how quickly they think on their feet and, and, and where they go. And, you know, oftentimes it's a good indication of, you know, if they're in client-facing roles um, such as accounting or, or financial services um, or even retail, um, it, it kind of goes to show, you know, how they would think being put in front of that situation. Great, thank you. If I uh, might just add that uh, before I ask my uh, hiring managers to do behavioral-based interviewing, I give them, um, you know, a, a 20 to 30 minute training at, at the very least uh, so that they can really get the most out of it. Uh, because if you are not in HR and, you know, you might have never heard of behavioral interviewing, um, you're going to not, you, you, you might uh, miss out on things like um, answers that are too general. For example, you would ask um, a student, please walk me through a situation where <clears throat> you had to take a risk or, or you had to deliver this project on time or whatever the question may be, and they would come right back to you and say, we delivered this and that and the other thing. And the hiring manager wouldn't know to go back and ask the follow-up question, well, you did that as a group, what was your specific role? So I give them a 20 to 30 minute um, uh, cheat sheet as to what to look out, uh, what, what, you know, not to accept as an answer and go back and drill them a little more and ask those follow-up questions. Yeah, yeah, the secret sauce in recruiting is always the probing. Uh, in any interview training I've ever done, yeah, you know, I'll give them the big questions. You know, that's in fact, you know, I, I we like to have them. You know, we we call them uh, uh, combo questions. We'll give them those. You know, that that. But what I want them to be good at is recognizing the cues. Okay, if, so like when they say the we or the usually or our team or things like that, then they know how to probe and dig and get to the core of that. But I, I'd like to respond in particular to the, what you had mentioned about uh, the hiring managers and being typically. Uh, more comfortable with assessing the technical skills. Uh, with my Canadian client that I was working with this summer, uh, they hire a lot of quant analysts. And they, they recognize two things. A, that they were already pretty good at assessing technical skill, which was great. But what's even better is that they recognized that what made the difference between average performers and top performers mm -hmm. was not the technical skill. It was not the, what they had learned uh, when they were in school. It was those softer skills. It was those. It was the beha their behaviors. It was the competencies directly related to those jobs. Uh, but they recognized that they just didn't know how to how to get there. And they too had questions. Okay, uh, they'd heard about behavioral interviewing. Uh, you know, can those questions get to both technical and uh, evidence as well as evidence of behaviors and competencies? And absolutely. You know, and, and the answer was absolutely yes. Uh, and that's where the combo questions and learning how to dig and probe. Uh, and knowing exactly what you're looking for, uh, you know, is is really helpful. So uh, I think that I think that happens more often than a lot of people think. I think that managers, technical managers, you know, they they've been doing the the technical assessment for so long that they do get frustrated when somebody isn't successful. And what, they're not successful again, typically because they they didn't accurately assess their ability to perform the technical duties of the job. They missed out that this this person's not motivated by the work. They missed they missed out that this person's not a self starter. And they missed out on a variety of factors that the behavioral interviewing would have would have gotten to. Yeah, I have a microphone. Well, thank you. You know, one of the things that I first do when a student comes in and we start working on their interviewing skills, I start off with let's go through some of the basic non behavioral interview questions and try to get an understanding of what it is the person who's interviewing you is trying to get at it with that information. What is it that they're really asking you? Because if you don't know what they're really asking you, it's very, very difficult to give them the appropriate answer. That usually people get it pretty quickly. They get an idea that you know, looking for a person who's a good fit and culturally a good fit and you know, is, is dedicated to the field and has all the skills necessary. 
the behavioral questions are a lot more difficult to help students prepare for, uh, simply by the nature, because there's no way to prepare them for every single behavioral question they could possibly get. You know, sometimes I take out a book and I show them, you know, there's 250 of these they can ask you. There's no way you can prepare for all of them. What I generally tell them to do at that point is to prepare about 10 stories. And the stories are the best way to answer it. And if they ask me, I'll tell them, you know, think of the, the, you know, the old uh, fairy tales. You know, once upon a time, there was a nice village and there was a fire-breathing dragon. Right? Not a good thing. It's killing the crops, scaring the women. And, you know, okay. But, uh, you know, and, and along came, but, 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 the, but the point is, so, you know, it's what we call situation, action, result. But you have, the, you have the dragon, and then along came the brave knight, used his bravery to slay the dragon. What happens? Marries the princess, and they live happily ever after. But that's really situation, action, result. That, you know, I came to a particular conference. They had nobody to sit up here from the career services side in order to do <laughs> the perspective of the career service and the behavioral interviewing, and I said, you know what, even though I didn't prepare for that, I will be up there and I'll do it, and hopefully, well, there'll be great happiness throughout the land at the end of this, but we'll see, I guess. But the idea is to prepare them for that, and that's the next step, so they come up with the 10 stories, and then the step after that is after they come up with their 10 stories, and I start asking them the questions, we've got to get into the probing questions. I said, look, I'm going to throw you against the wall here. When you tell me that you jumped up there and did that, why did you think you were able to do that? Were you able to do that? How did you do? Uh, what preparation could you have done to make yourself you know, better prepared for that? You know, how did that happen? Different things like that. That really forces them to go beyond just the prepared uh, 10 stories they may have. Thank you. I actually uh, use the acronym STAR, Situation, Task, Action, Result. It's just easier to remember, but it's the same thing. Um, so <clears throat> you, you do prepare them for behavioral interviewing. I'm probably in the wrong de decade, but I thought that most colleges don't. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, uh, okay, I was going to respond to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I enjoyed the time, you know, ten years ago when actually that was the case, where most colleges weren't, and we, um, as the uh, corporate recruiters, could take advantage of that and really assess. And, and, and not that we are uh, trying to catch them off guard, but just to get, uh, get, you know, I guess at the uh, most truthful uh, state of. Uh, uh, they experience, uh, but but you are right to your point. You can't possibly prepare yeah. them very well. You just you could just we can't prepare them for that, right? And and just say, well, whatever you're asked, just answer with the real factual right. um, situation that you've been through. Yeah, and two other things that I, that I generally mention. I usually tell a student that if you don't know the answer <laughs> to the question, you get something wrong. Don't try and pretend like you were right and try and fix it along because. I've seen people in interviewing to play with them like a cat with a ball of yarn. They'll keep them in their own circles until so they finally conclude that they know that, okay, I was wrong. You just you admit it up front and, and keep going. But you know, in addition to that, I think really you can really tell uh, that a lot of interviews that never get you beyond sort of the rehearsal. If you've been rehearsed well and you work with your career services person, unless you get somebody who's really good at interviewing, they might not get beyond that. And I guess that's, from what I, my experience, a significant portion of interviews people get at entry level never get beyond sort of the beginning, just sort of standard things you would rehearse. Uh, the preparation, where, where the real, you know, where you talk about separating uh, the top from uh, some a little bit lower quality is what they do when they don't know the right answer for mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. how they yeah, think on their feet, feet, how they answer a question if they don't know the answer. Yeah, that's a really good point because uh, that particularly came into play with my client and the use of case studies. And... Uh, that you know, they weren't necessarily looking so much for the right answer, but they were they were more interested. They were really much more interested in the approach, you know. And, and you know, if they got to a point where they didn't know, if they were at least able to demonstrate uh, again, probably just as much behavior, uh, you know, or behavior related evidence as well as their technical knowledge, then at least they could, they would get you know some very strong insight because you know some of their case studies were actually really difficult. I'm sure many of you have heard questions, uh, kinds of questions that uh, Microsoft and the Googles of the world are asking, like why are men's, uh, how many gas stations are there in, in, in the world? Mm -hmm. And they want to see you think, and how do you come up with, with the answer? Um, or yes, but Google just said that's a bunk. <laughs> they, they came out with the evidence. They just, they've, they've studied themselves for years, and they just this past year came out and said, you know what? We re we've recognized now that after all these years and collecting all this data that it absolutely is, has had zero correlation to performance. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. By the way, I, I, do, I do have to... I'd like to take a look at that. I do have to mention my, my one pet peeve working with students when someone asks a student for their weakness. Mm -hmm. 
And the reason I don't like this question, because nobody's actually honestly answering the question, like, you know, I like sleeping late, I come into work at 3 o'clock. I mean, nobody's answering the question honestly. And the idea is just to see, oh, do you know the game of how to answer that question? Yeah. I used to joke around with students. I told them, never say this in an interview, but that question shows the weakness of the interviewer, not the interviewee. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's a perspective. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Not a popular one. I agree. Maybe, maybe that's I agree weakness, with that. By the way, no, you know, my weakness is I speak my mind. I guess. I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to monopolize here, but it's it just I, I, another really good point here. We uh, another client of ours actually just up in Times Square, Yahoo, who we've done a ton of interview training with this year. They, uh, I, I was uh, training a group of their media hiring managers. And I made a joke at the beginning. I said, okay, every other month on Yahoo, there's an article out there about the 10 most commonly asked interview questions, and they're typically those. You know, the what are your weaknesses, how do you answer the how do you, what is your weakness question. And I said, not only are you asking these types of questions, but you're giving them the answers. Yeah. You know, <laughs> what good is that? That's absolutely right. The only thing I would add is, is just the, the fact that to add to your point is that the training aspect of it is key. I know we don't send anybody to interview on campus um, unless they've been to our training or be it, you know, an hour um, prep or something. But I think you really need to you need to prepare the interviewers because you want to make sure they're asking those questions and um, the appropriate probing and follow up because of it, essentially they're going to be the ones that are determining the next step for those candidates. So I think the training is is absolutely key. You know, training your your uh, resources to go out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and also uh, to build on that point to provide them with the right assessment tools. Sure. You know, a, a simple form that they absolutely have to give back to you. Um, after hours of chasing, then, as, you, as you all know. Uh, but it has to be there because, especially if they're an inexperienced college interviewer, um, they would think they remember every student out of, you know, 10 people they've met uh, today, but they forget. I mean, we know after years of making that mistakes, uh, mistake, but uh, they don't. They, they might rely too much of it on their memory. And, of course, uh, you know, all sorts of... Uh, other benefits that an, a good assessment tool provides, <laughs> like a simple form. Thank you. Um, anybody from the audience, please? We've been two panels here. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just a question about um, the sort of combination of the STAR technique and the and, and, and behavioural competency interviews. Um, I know quite a lot of our graduate recruitment clients in, in the UK at the moment are moving away from competency interviewing because they're sick of students being so well prepared and gaming, effectively gaming the, uh, the, the, the competency-based interview. Is that something you're seeing and how are you tackling that? And also is that, you know, is that leading to people moving to things like strengths-based interviewing, that kind of stuff? Uh, Uh, typically, uh, I, we believe that people can only be us so much. So it's really on the on the interviewers to be really effective probers and to really get deep. So it's you know getting to the the star, the core, okay, yeah. the core. Because uh, again, people you know and, and you know really smart hiring managers usually can play around and and get you know and, and really probe in ways that the the candidate can't possibly be prepared. To answer about, uh, so I think that that's one thing. Um, I would also add to to also remember the basics. Like I'll do some behavioral questions, but I'll also ask about the resume. Sometimes they're so prepared for these behavioral questions that you'll ask them to elaborate more on um, one of the line items or you know one of the the projects or something that they worked on, and they weren't prepared for that. Um, so not that you're trying to catch them, but you know you do want to you know you don't want to make it just behavioral, but I think having a, a good mix between the two and, and act, you know, acting them. Yeah, we like, uh, we also like situational interviewing as well. So that would be uh, case studies or whiteboard examples, I think, to be able to, especially for more technical positions, uh, you know, where they can actually show you uh, some of their work, uh, do things in front of you, you can actually capture that. I think there's a lot of value to that as well. Uh, and even, you know, whether you have a case study or a whiteboard example, there's opportunities to to probe the candidate as they're going through that and ask them how they're you know coming to these conclusions. Or you know, if throw a wrench in the middle, okay, this the situation just changed. Now, how would you react? And you can learn a lot about that as well. I think keeping you know, candidates on their toes with those types of things and good probing is how you get beyond the 
over preparedness. Yeah, you actually brought up a very good point because uh, it is important to kind of stay ahead of the gamers, but you can never become 100% gamer proof. There are always going to be uh, smart ones out there that, that are going to um, make you believe that they're the best candidate, and once they show up in three months, you realize it's a performance problem. We're never going to be 100% safe. Uh, but I think, to, to your point, um, the, the combination of behavioral, situational, um, technical, and, and just real, you know, and, and a simple card blanche, as I call it, you know, tell me about yourself stuff works. And it also very much depends on the types of people you're looking for, right? So it's, it's important to identify your strategy and include some of these elements um, as you know, appropriate. To go through the process, though, when we're preparing students, usually it's a process. I'll meet with them the first time, discuss strategy, presenting your best self. And the second time, I'll start doing an actual mock interview. I'll be asking them the questions. And where I sort of introduce the idea that you might not be familiar with something, I'll always ask them, have you ever failed at anything? And I would say about 75% of the time, that freezes them. Because it's like, I'm supposed to present my best self, but I know the answer can't be no. So what do I do? And that gives them an introduction to the concept of the idea that you really need to be prepared for things that you're not necessarily prepared for and know how to answer them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Uh, one of the differentiators. Oh. So the interview process can be one of the differentiators in candidates deciding which company they join and, and which company they don't and so forth. So we're in 2014, one of the things I'm looking at is how do we sort of differentiate ourselves from the standard run-of-the-mill behavioral interviewing? And, and that goes to sort of the, the group project to where you, you take, you know, four to five students, put them in a few groups around the room and have HR be observers of that group and how they work together as, as to solve a problem or a certain project and so forth. While you're still getting to observe behavioral competencies just in a little bit of a different non-one-on-one -one, one -on -one setting. So what has your experience been with those type of tactics and, and how successful ha have you seen those both from a corporate perspective as well as from an interviewee perspective? Let me just clarify because uh, I'm not sure I understood con completely. Um, so you have four or five students at a college sitting, interacting, working on a project, correct? And all of them are potentially your candidates, correct? correct? And, and you have an HR person sitting and observing. I, honestly, I have never done this in my life. It's a great idea. I'm going to steal it. But, uh, <laughs> I've, you know, I've never done it either. But one thing that I have done, you know, and I think it can't be un underestimated, is when you're at the corporate presentation or you're hosting students, you know, for a presentation on site, is observing how they interact with the people in the room. You know, just that general observation can go a really long way. And, you know, we would always uh, get all of the, the business people that were in the room, whether they were HR or they were managers or juniors that, that happened to come to the presentation and say, you know, tell me, who were your, you know, three or four favorite people you met and who would you say absolutely not? They wouldn't fit in here, you know, and tell us why. And we just have a conversation about it. And most of the time we would agree on the same, you know, people because those behaviors come out in a social setting. It doesn't necessarily need to be in a case study or a formal interview situation, but you can see how they're interacting and how they're answering questions or how they're uh, even talking about and presenting themselves uh, the way that they're selling themselves that can be very effective. So I'd imagine in that particular scenario it would also be effective. I just haven't had experience with that. Uh, we've done something sim similar. We've never done um, group case studies. We've done individual case studies for some of our more technical um, service lines but when we're interviewing on campus we do try to make we have pre-interview socials the night before and we do try to try our best to do events where we can see how they interact um, with each other be it a you know like a cooking class or some kind of bowling just to see who's the one that's just standing there waiting for their turn or you know who's interacting so it's kind of an informal way to um, get that team dynamic without them realizing that that's something we're looking at um, but we've never done um, group I think the closest thing I've seen is, extern is uh, externship days. So you're getting the candidate uh, group of uh, candidates in for a day, uh, and you know it's not necessarily seen as an interview, but 
you know, they're doing group activities, maybe even like a community service activity. Uh, there could be a lot of different opportunities for group interaction, and and the recruiters and the other and you know the other uh, employees in the room are paying very close attention to those interaction you know, interactions and those behaviors. Uh, so that would be probably the closest thing I've seen, and I think they were relatively effective. Yeah, so, you know, actually, uh, maybe you can turn that around a little bit, you know, because a lot of times companies will do information sessions, and that's a great way for them to be introduced to students at a campus and start building their pipeline. What is it that makes students stand out to you as employers when you come and visit a campus at the information sessions that you'll be hosting? It's, it's, it's on, no? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I, yeah. Okay. Questions to the audience. Okay. I didn't have an answer to your question. <laughs> I get ignored all the time. It's not a big deal. Somebody here had a. Uh, oh, because he was asking a question. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's to turn it around. What do I yeah. do with the mic? I have a question. Okay. okay. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. It's right. <laughs> I'll be here all week, I guess. <laughs> Tip your waiter on the way out. It's all good. <laughs> but, but just staying on the theme of case studies, um, for organizations with large volumes, and we can only have like half conduct half hour interviews. How do you implement case studies and at what stage? Like how, how long does it take to implement a case study? Do you do it at the first round stage, the super day stage? Um, you know, how, how does that help you differentiate your candidates? Well, I, can, I can speak to that and I mean, if you want to con contribute more. We didn't do it in the scenario like you were, you know, explaining, but we did have case studies. And, uh, you know, like I said, I was at an investment bank and our structured finance division wanted to do case studies. And they would do it. It was the business that managed it. We would help them to coordinate it from an HR perspective and getting the candidates there. But the managers were the ones actually assessing the work and running it because they're the experts, obviously. Uh, but they would do it after, in most cases, it was after the phone interview stage, you know, usually after two rounds of phone interviews. They would bring them in and say okay now now show us show us your stuff you know when you're when you're interviewing in particular for internships you know you just don't usually have the luxury to bring them in multiple times over and over and over uh, so they would usually have two rounds of phone interviews with them and if there was a, a level of confidence that you know they could be a good fit we would invite them to participate in that uh, and and it seemed to be pretty effective mm -hmm. um, and that's a Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. That's a good segue to what I was uh, going to, to, to ask. Um, in addition to uh, the content of the interview, there's process as well. Um, so uh, Travis just shared two rounds of phone interviews, and uh, then if that works well, uh, they would bring people in. Um, my experience has been um, one phone interview then we sent a group um, out on campus, uh, on multiple campuses actually, and then we weed out from there, and then the remaining um, 50 people, let's say, would be flown over for uh, what we called at Honeywell, well, for example, a fantastic Friday where we, we would have a round robin, mul multiple teams of interviews um, in the same building, and, and then students rotating between these groups, and then at the end of the day, uh, we would go through everybody and decide who would be a good fit for, for who. Um, and we only have a few minutes left, so um, unfortunately. Uh, any uh, uh, suggestions, ideas, experiences as far as the process? Sorry, I hear this from, from my hiring managers all the time. They said, you know, that person was great. They have the skills we need, but it felt very robotic. I would ask a question. They would give an answer, and there was no real conversation. There was no dialogue. Um, something I was always taught was QAQ, question, answer, question. Uh, you give an answer, and then you ask a question back, and it, and it just seems like something's missing, and, and, and I feel like we've passed on candidates who might have been great for jobs just because they didn't have this rapport with the hiring manager. I didn't know if that's something that you run into. Is that something you, you coach when you are speaking to these students or how you might deal with it? One of the I always say is used card salesmen will not necessarily make the best employees everywhere. And the point is a lot of these people can really give you a sales pitch, but there might not be anything deep behind it. So, you know, there's a whole... Um, scholarly and an idea and literature about helping more introverted people with their interviewing. It's a significant challenge because they're looking for the person who's really able to engage. And I guess when you look at it you know, from a sort of a, you know, a, a broader perspective, it's almost not fair 
that this is the thing that Peace Center is going to be assessed based on because there are some people for whom that is not the way they present themselves. So, you know, I think a lot of things, I like the idea of more video-based interviewing because there are a lot of students who are more introverted that feel much more comfortable using that kind of uh, medium as opposed to actually doing it in person. But again, like I said, used car salesmen do not necessarily make all the best employees. And the idea is to try to get beyond and find the measure of the person as opposed to the very ability to just project or sell themselves. And that, that's a great point. And, and, and again, uh, it all depends on what kind of function you are hiring the person, right? If you're looking for a salesperson, <laughs> you have to put them in front of you and see how they could chat and talk you uh, into thinking that they're the best in the world. Um, and if you're looking for an accountant, that's a different story. So it has to, we have, as the HR and recruiters, uh, we have to manage the expectations of the hiring team that we sent out on campuses, in my opinion. Um, all right, we have two minutes, so um, one or two more questions, comments. I was about to say, by the way, the uh, extroverted accounts usually become recruiters. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, the funny thing, a little secret about myself, if you looked at my Myers-Briggs, I'm an introvert. <laughs> I've just had to learn how to present myself in front of people and, you know, in, able to, in, in order to be able to do the job that I do. And, you know, I think that the video opportunity is a, is a great idea in theory, but at the same time, after they get past that, they're going to have to show up to work and work in person every day right. too. So you also need to be able to assess how they interact with people on a personal level, in person, face to face. You know, it's actually interesting because I'm also very introverted. People tend not to believe that because I can project myself in public. I will tell you, when I get home, I'm going to be absolutely exhausted because I really need to get into character for when I do something like this. Luckily, my bears are on tonight, so if they win, I'll be happy. <laughs> but uh, it, it is, you know, it, it's tough. But again, sometimes you just need to do it. You know, and, and I that... think introverted versus extroverted, that the way we perceive it, 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 there's a little bit of a misperception going on because introverted is how you recharge yourself. Right. Uh, I would go home, and after my kids are in bed, I would reach. I, I don't want anybody talk, talking to me, touching me. I'm in front of my book or TV. That's it. Don't even, you know, try to approach me. I'm an introvert, but I love communicating and. So it doesn't necessarily. Uh, back, back to your question. I, I would, you know, when I've had people ask me all the time. I, I, you know, typical responses: Are you looking to hire a great interviewee, or are you looking to hire a great engineer, or a great fin financial? And, and then my follow-up would be: What do you? What did you do to pull the candidate out? I mean, let's face it: These are young people who are often very intimidated, uh, very nervous. Uh, in these situations, it's really on the recruiter. The recruiter is, is their main job is facilitating the conversation. It's not on the candidate. Right. Yeah. It's still, it's still their responsibility. <laughs> right. So I'll take one more 30-second comment, and with that, we'll have to close, unfortunately. Sure. You mentioned Myers-Briggs. Do any, Have any of you seen in your fields the use of cognitive assessment as a supplement or anything as part of the interviewing? I have, but uh, at a much higher level than college recruitment. So um, to, to invest all that time... Uh, and energy into that uh, at the college level, with no disrespect, I've always found there's n it, the, the ROI is not really there. Um, but for the executive level, yes, I have. I've seen it uh, to some degree, but it's usually not here. Uh, I've seen it more in the UK and Europe uh, that it's used. It seems to be more popular. I know that, you know, in, in my former uh, post, we were evaluating whether or not we would use it here. But then when we looked at all the other banks on the street, no one else was using it. And we said, you know what, it's really not relevant to our students. Who's going to take the time to do it for us when they don't have to do it for anybody else? Um, so I think it, it's, it's not that it's impossible to use or that you shouldn't use it. You just really need to evaluate whether or not, as Yana said, the ROI is there and whether you'll, you'll get something good out of it or you'll just scare people away. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you for all your comments, and thank you to the panel. Okay.